Bom, boa tarde a todos. Uh, é um grande prazer abrir esse curso de transplante cardíaco. Eu sou o professor Walter Gomes, da disciplina de cirurgia cardiovascular da Escola Paulista de Medicina da Unifesp. E é com grande satisfação que nós fazemos esse curso em parceria com o Miami Transplant Institute sobre esse tema, um tema palpitante, cada vez mais relevante na nossa prática diária, pelos benefícios que isso traz para o paciente. Então, eu queria ressaltar a importância desse curso e também da oportunidade de congraçamento dessa união dessas duas universidades em prol desse tipo de conhecimento. Uh, algumas, uh, algumas informações antes de que o link de presença vai estar disponível e isso tem importância depois para a emissão dos certificados. Qualquer pergunta adicional uh, deve ser feita no, no chat do YouTube e nós vamos ter a oportunidade de discutir depois, depois da, da aula. E que uh, os certificados vão ser uh, a quem uh, participar tiver uma frequência maior do que 80% do total das aulas. Uh, eu queria iniciar Inicialmente, antes de apresentar a doutora Gisele Guerra, que é a palestrante de hoje, eu, iria, eu vou pedir para dois uh, cirurgiões cardíacos de grande importância uh, que hoje trabalham no, em, em Miami para poderem expressar a, a sua visão sobre o curso e a importância uh, dessa parceria que nós estamos estabelecendo entre as duas universidades. Primeiro, o doutor Leonardo Molinari. Por favor, doutor Leonardo. Obrigado, doutor Walter. É uma satisfação poder estar aqui para abrir e participar desse evento de transplante cardíaco junto com a Universidade de São Paulo e a Universidade de Miami, que esse tema transplante é... Eu tenho o prazer de trabalhar aqui numa instituição que é referência mundial na área de transplante. É, e, e hoje estar aqui, a nossa é, diretora médica, que é a doutora Gisele Guerra, vai nos falar. E estamos abertos para qualquer, como você mesmo citou, intercâmbios. E vamos fortalecer mais esse laço e nos aproximar cada vez mais. Obrigado, doutor Walter. Muito obrigado, doutor Leonardo. Eu queria agora pedir a palavra para o professor Thomas Salerno. O professor Thomas Salerno é um dos ícones da cirurgia cardíaca mundial, um mentor de muitos cirurgiões em, em todo o mundo e também no Brasil. O professor Salerno, é uma honra tê-lo na abertura do nosso curso. Uh, Precisa ativar o microfone, professor. Muito Isso. obrigado, Walter, pela, pela apresentação. Eu, como brasileiro, tenho muito orgulho de apresentar o MTI para esse grupo de, de, das pessoas que estão presentes. Gisele Guerra é o Medical Director, do, junto com uh, o Rodrigo Viana, um dos maiores centros de transplante, talvez, do mundo. É o número um nos Estados Unidos. E fico muito orgulhoso de saber que ele é levado por um brasileiro como Leonardo é brasileiro, Viana é brasileiro. Isso nos traz muito orgulho. E foi através desse relacionamento entre o Viana e o Walter que estamos desenvolvendo esse intercâmbio entre as instituições no Brasil. Isso terá muito valor para nós aprendermos dos brasileiros e talvez os brasileiros aprenderem também do, do, do Rodrigo Brasil, que é brasileiro, mas que está nos Estados Unidos. Vocês gostarão da apresentação e eu tinha muito gosto de vê-los e muito obrigado por me convidar para participar nessa reunião. Bom, o prazer e a honra é toda nossa. Eu queria antes agradecer uh, ao Dr. João Breda, à professora Solange Gizellini, que pela contribuição nesse curso, Dr. João Breda é do Miami e Transplant Instituto, a doutora Solange Gizellini é professora da Unifesp, sem a contribuição deles, esse curso não seria possível. E vocês vejam que boa parte dos cirurgiões que trabalham no Miami Transplant Institute são brasileiros. Quer dizer, a competência e a capacidade de trabalho dessas pessoas elevaram eles a esse posto, que seguramente não foi fácil de chegar. 
que isso sirva de exemplo dessa persistência, essa capacidade de trabalho, essa competência para outros cirurgiões, principalmente os jovens que estão aqui nos assistindo, também galguem esses degraus e alcancem não só essa importância nos Estados Unidos, mas também aqui no Brasil, quer dizer, todo esse aprendizado tem que reverter para que essa área também seja uh, elevada aqui no Brasil. Bom, hoje, uh, por um problema que nós tivemos com o doutor uh, Rodrigo Viana, que está preso no centro cirúrgico com uma cirurgia, um transplante, que até agora ele não conseguiu sair. E uh, isso é a nossa vida, uh, médico e cirurgião cardíaco, principalmente de transplante, essa é a nossa rotina. Bom, mas para substituir o doutor Rodrigo Viana, nós temos hoje a doutora Gisele Guerra, que é professor of uh, clinical medicine da University of Miami Miller School of Medicine e medical director of uh, transplant service. Uh, ela vai falar sobre uh, what the difference in centers specializing in solid organ transplant can make. Um, Dr. Guerra, uh, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Please uh, go ahead. É um prazer apresentar hoje, desculpa, uh, eu falo um pouco portunho, <laughs> but my presentation will be in English. <laughs> no problem. Okay, uh, the slides are up. Okay, right. tá bom. Right. Muito obrigada. Okay. I am uh, Dr. Giselle Guerra. I'm a professor of medicine here at the Miami Transplant Institute. My specialty is actually nephrology. I'm not a cardiologist, but I, I work very closely with our cardiologist and I am the medical director here at the Miami Transplant Institute. So uh, it is my honor and my pleasure to present today and to really take you through the phases of what it is to be an institute and why it's so important to build an institute in order to develop the best care for our patients and our programs here. All right, our mission has been, uh, number one, to build the most comprehensive solid organ transplant program in the world. And to do so, it does require multiple disciplines working together. And that is gonna be the resonating message that I will uh, continue to say, because it's not one person, one individual that makes this happen. It is a team of doctors, nurses, uh, ancillary staff, that makes us provide the best care for our patients and makes us what we perceive to be the best uh, institute uh, that we could have built. Uh, second thing uh, as part of our mission of this institute was to provide cutting edge research. And one of the latest things that we've been closely working on is with xenotransplantation with one of our premier surgeons, Dr. Joe Tector. So that is very important to us. Uh, one thing that we strongly believe in, believe in is this message of transplantation without borders. And that's why we believe in this collaborative effort, not only to uh, work with other uh, regional transplant institutes and uh, also at a national level, but more importantly, throughout the world. It is a global view that actually makes things better uh, and advances care for transplantation. And last but not least is, again, provide excellence in the care of both acute and chronic patients across all solid organ transplant li lines. And the only way to achieve it is through this multidisciplinary approach. So what do we, what do we have to offer? And it, it begins with products and services. With solid organ transplantation, we have to develop a ways of understanding and communicating across all lines. So one of the things that we learned to establish was standardization of transplant protocols. If we do not do certain things and standardize, we are not able to monitor the patients the right way. And instead of treating just individual patients, we learn to treat many patients and customize their care over across, across service lines. And this will give us the capabilities of treating very complex cases even before patients even reach the need for transplantation. 
It is critical that we advance the medical management and assessment of patients ac across all solid organ transplant service lines. So care does not begin with the moment the patient goes for a transplant. Care begins from the time of referral. And that is one of the things that we have learned to communicate, not only locally, but at a national level, and even at times internationally, the importance of optimizing care and learning when it's the right time to transfer patients so we could actually give them the best care possible. Of course, this requires technical expertise in both medical and surgical advances. And one of the things that actually that the COVID-19 that I actually think was of huge benefit uh, across transplantation and other medical complex service lines is the use of telemedicine. This has actually opened up many opportunities uh, in order to treat patients and actually provide areas of consultation across service lines to better the care of patients. We have established uniform clinical pathways to ensure the patient's safety and outcomes. And again, how do we measure our outcomes? If we're not able to measure our outcomes, we cannot better improve the care of patients. So one of the things that we've learned to establish is how are we going to monitor patients, both on the pre side and on the post side, so we could better improve the care of our patients. And last but not least is the development of an international market. Again, transplantation without borders. So why an institute? Why the MTI? So the Miami Transplant Institute came about uh, many years back because it is a partnership between Jackson Memorial Hospital and the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine. It's a very interesting partnership that started in 1970, and it's important to understand because actually this is probably the most unique relationship that across um, the United States we have seen. Uh, in fact, I just came back from San Diego at the American Transplant Congress, and one of the premier things they've wanted to actually see how we were able to do is how we were able to combine an academic private entity with the largest public health system in the United States to form this institute and to thrive to better the care of so many patients that it's needed. Um, in uh, so as a, re as a result of that, that, and that, that partnership, the Miami Transplant Institute, is probably the premier program here that has been able to capitalize. And as a result of that, we've been able to perform more than 750 transplant procedures annually. And it, it crosses all the service lines, kidney, kidney, pancreas, liver, intestinal, heart, and lung. And it's very interesting because I think one of the things that becomes so unique is this has attracted very complex cases where multiple patients are requiring dual organs or even more than that. Uh, we, it, we have done recently combined um, uh, on blocks, liver, hearts. Uh, we do combinations all the time with kidney transplants. And of course, we are known for our expert care that Dr. Vienna leads with multivisceral transplants. So on a yearly basis, this is this level of multidisciplinary approach has been able to actually grow and actually be able to handle the more complex care that other places cannot. So it's important to know that MTI is the only Florida hospital to perform every type of organ transplant with the largest program that has been established as of 2019. So this is what a transplant enterprise looks like. And I think it's very important and very uh, I could I actually could spend a whole entire hour on this slide alone. And it's very interesting because it's not one entity that's important. Everything plays into another entity. So if you take, for example, the OPO relations, that is when we first, there's 58 organ procurement organizations throughout the country. And we literally here at the Miami Transplant Institute have worked with every single OPO. And it's critical because since we're such an aggressive center that deals with such complex cases, we need to have very close relationship and ties with these OPOs in order to maximize and optimize the organs in order for us to have even better results. So that's just one small entity of the big picture of this transplant enterprise. All these other components that are involved are critical. Even as administrative as you could think of from billing and finances, because 
if we don't, if our patients don't have the proper support, both from a family component as well as a financial component, our outcomes are going to suffer. So if they don't have means to actually pay, and here in the United States it's important to understand, they have to pay for their medications. If it's not covered by the proper insurance and they require co-pays, then the patient will not get the medication. And obviously it will be pointless to have a transplant done because they will reject um, within a certain period of time. So all these entities, as it continues, as we've continued to grow, we've actually had to build teams around these entities in order for us to be successful. If you look at the blue borders, when you're looking at this, these are our ancillary services. So our surgeons and physicians are the leaders, the champions of these teams. But if we do not have the other components of the multidisciplinary team, we will not be successful. We are tightly bound with our nurses who are the voice for our patients. And if we are not, if they're not part of our daily routine care of our patients, we will not be able to serve the thousands of patients like we do successfully. And at the end of the day, uh, with the next few slides, you will see the importance of monitoring in order to determine how well we're gonna do over time. So what's the need of an institute? It's the most effective way collaboration between institutions and hospitals. It's a way for us to be efficient in providing the best patient care, but it goes beyond that. We're just not here to provide a clinical service. We're here to do research and we're here to educate. We call this the three pillars. You have to be able to clinically excel, but at the same time, we have to have the entities to be innovative and to grow and to push the boundaries for us to develop not only from new medications, but new ways to actually be able to transplant and optimize organs in order for an us, our motto is, we do not wanna have any patients dying on the list. So if that's the case, that's why um, with time, we've invested in certain uh, projects such as xenotransplantation, because we know there's just not enough organs to actually help with so many patients that are ending up uh, with end organ failure. Um, it's a, um, medicine has advanced so much as we all know to the point that patients are living longer, but their comorbidities are hurting them more and more. And actually we have to be able to advance and be able to give them that gift of life. So I think if it wasn't for research, we wouldn't be able to continue the path that we are. And as an institute, you have to invest in this. And the, the very single most important thing is what's the future gonna be like? If we don't have students, residents and fellows and we don't teach them as well as other physicians even throughout the world, it is then we will not be able to actually continue with our mission. So if the three pillars, one is not more than important than the other. They're all important and we have to actually embrace that in order to move forward. So, just a little bit of a view of our history. Like I said, we started in the 1970s here and the first transplant, I'm proud to say was a kidney transplant. Molinari is always laughing and so, so is Dr. Salerno because they're saying, oh, we're always talking about the kidney because that's my specialty. But it's important to know that was the first transplant that was done here. So <laughs> that doesn't say it's not important. Um, but of course, uh, our second in line was our heart transplant. So it, it gives me great honor to make sure that heart transplant wasn't far away. Then came the liver transplant in 1987 and then in the KP transplant in 1990. And then we did our first intestinal transplant in 1994. Our first ALVAD um, program started in 1995. And shortly after that came the lung transplant. Uh, um, and then at the same time, the pancreas transplant uh, program took shape. Um, then, like I said, what we have been known is uh, for our dual organs as well. So we started in 2000 with a heart lung transplant. And in 2003, we did our first abdominal wall transplant in the world. Uh, and uh, 2010, we were honored with uh, a Medal of Distinction, Silver Level Designation for Kidney Transplant Outcomes, and Bronze Level Designation by the U.S. Department of Health Services and the Liver and Pancreas Transplants. 
Um, in 2011, shortly after that, HealthGrades names MTI one of the nation's top three heart organ transplant centers at that time. Then in 2012, again, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services honors the MTI with a civil uh, level designation for kidney, kidney, pancreas, and lung transplants and bronze level for the heart transplant. Um, in 2012, uh, uh, actually, I was here to see this. It was the first five organ transplant recipient to give birth. Um, and it was, uh, it was actually amazing to be part of that event. In 2014, I was very happy. I was at that time the medical director of the Living Donor Program, and we were very started, excited to start our paired exchange program under the Living Donor uh, Kidney Team. And we, the first one, we were proud to say we did a three-way paired exchange, and it was the first ever in the state of Florida. Um, it's important to highlight that in 2013, Dr. Vienna came, and that's when the institute really started. It was not a virtual institute. We actually unified forces and did, had an agreement to really have the Miami Transplant Institute take shape. And really, I think that catapulted us to the next level. In 2015, Jackson Memorial Hospital unveils a unit, and at that time, it was absolutely necessary because we needed it to house all our patients. And actually right now we have three floors uh, alone just for to house all our transplant patients. Uh, in 2015, we went on to did a four-way paired exchange. And like I told you in 2018, we did our first on-block hard liver and we've done already, I think, um, eight cases um, thus far. Um, and 20, between 2018 and 2020, we grew to be the largest kidney transplant program in the nation with three consecutive years. In 2019 to 2020, we were proud to say we're the largest transplant uh, center on the nation for two consecutive years. So to say the least, we've been quite busy. In 2021, we did our first robotic assisted during nephrectomy in Southeast. Um, and... Um, and actually, we went on to do our first robotic assisted kidney transplant in 2022. Uh, it's really interesting to see that program take shape. We've done already over 200 surgeries, of which 75 have been uh, robotic donor nephrectomies. So I am, I'm really proud to say that we don't do any more laparoscopic surgeries. And it's been amazing to see the quality of care that we're giving our patients at this point in time because they're able to go home in under 24 hours and they feel 100 times better. So it's really improving the care of individuals that are giving the gift of life to another individual and they deserve to have that uh, tender loving care at this point. Um, what's more exciting to see is the kidney transplants being done that way. And we actually think with the robotic program growing the way it is, it's actually gonna serve even bigger needs. For example, in the liver and side, in the GI side, many of the oncology surgeries are actually gonna be done robotically. And they, are, they have huge capabilities uh, going down the pipeline. And then I'm actually very excited to say in 2023, we did our first paired exchange both two donors and two recipients were done robotically. So that's the first ever documented uh, the, that we've known in the world. And this is so far the team, uh, our thoracic surgeon, Dr. Uh, Machuco, Tiago Machuca, who is another native Brazilian from Curitiba. And of course, Dr. Viana, and then Dr. Abreu uh, and Dr. Riella. So I'm really surrounded by Bra Brazilians. At this point in time, I feel Brazilian already. <laughs> So it's very important to know that we should be very orgulloso, very proud of our Brazilian team. Um, with regards to our number of transplants, as you can see, uh, since we started the MTI here in 2013, we had started with 420 transplants being done, and we basically close to doubled our volumes. Uh, and, I, and I must say the more important thing is our complexity has increased significantly. And that's really important both on the thoracic and abdominal side because it comes hand in hand. We don't make the distinction as an institute between one organ and another. We're here to help and collaborate with each other. And that is the key component. Though you, we may, uh, some of us may be doing heart, some of us may be doing kidney, we meet on a weekly basis for us to actually help each other out 
and actually improve the care of our patients and then work on research projects together to continue to be innovative and, uh, and push the boundaries. Uh, the only thing I do want to highlight, COVID did hit us very hard. And so even the, we did dip down uh, to 600 transplants, we've been able to recover since then. Uh, this are our transplants floor, and we're very proud because this has really given us the capabilities to actually continue to help so many patients. And like I said, we have three floors now just dedicated uh, to transplant. Uh, and the, about a year and a half ago, we actually have put into place two ICUs distinctly uh, that were built just for us with each ICU over 25 beds to take care of our patients. So it's really remarkable the advances that we've had and it's just been to the support of Jackson Health System with the University of Miami. Now, it's quite complex, our leadership system. We have uh, Dr. Megoya, who is the president and CEO of the Jackson Health System. And of course, Dr. Viana leading the path for us. Uh, myself uh, as the medical director, and then we do have a VP of transplant ser uh, services as well as uh, a physician who's the director of our practice. So we, we do understand the complexity uh, and the moving parts that we have to have in the support across the University of Miami and Jackson Health System in order for us to be able to collaborate and continue to grow. Uh, what's interesting is we did create a mass system uh, and, and Dr. Viana is the MTI medical, uh, the MTI director, helps over, oversee uh, this. It's a committee that actually meets with the CEO and the CEO, uh, CEO of both the University of Miami and Jackson Health System. And major efforts and initiatives are taken through the MASS system in order for us to promote and to continue to, to promote our institute. On the educational side, it's very important that we work with the University of Miami closely. So the department of chairs, as well as the dean works with us, um, both with Dr. Viana as the surgical director and myself as the medical director, to can not only to continue to promote our faculty, but more importantly, to emphasize the importance of research and education. So we work hand in hand with each of the uh, division chairs and the department chairs to make this happen. On the research side, we do have an MTI research director. Currently, is Dr. Joe Tector, and he's the one that's heading up xenotransplantation as the major research pro uh, entity that's going on. But we have many research projects, both from a translational as well as, more importantly, clinical side, in order for us to continue to be innovative. They do report to Dr. Viana as well as the dean at this point in time. Now. This slide, I'm not expecting anybody to understand this slide, except so you could understand how things have grown and changed so much. Um, as I said, Dr. Viana heads up as the director of the Institute, um, but on the medical side, he uh, is overwhelmed to say that there are more medical physicians than surgeons under the directorship. So uh, he's always complaining to me how much, how much medicine is involved, <laughs> but he's very proud of that entity. It was, if it wasn't for his undertaking and, the, and him understanding the importance of this multidisciplinary approach, we would not have been able to achieve what we've been able to achieve. So currently right now, when we started, we had 20 physicians. And today we have 58 physicians that are, are under our direction here at the Miami Transplant Institute. And again, it involves medicine, uh, it involves um, psychiatry, it involves pedi uh, the pediatric service line, and anesthesia uh, on the side also is involved. And the reason why this is so important is because all these physicians need to work together to provide the best care across all solid organ trans transplant service lines. And as you can see, we have several adult and pediatric service lines. We have adult and pediatric kidney service line, adult and pediatric liver GI service lines. We have an intestinal rehab. We also have adult and pediatric cardiology service line. Same thing with the lung service line. We actually are very excited to say that we started our own intensivist group. And again, we grew so much and uh, the level of complexity was so much that instead of having a separate entity under the hospital to take care of our patients, we actually incorporated intensivists that involves pulmonologists, cardiologists, anesthesiologists, 
um, even uh, ER physicians that are critically trained to take care of transplant patients. And right now that has been a major entity, especially on the cardiothoracic side, to really help uh, uh, promote the care of our patients. Uh, we have also grown and we have our own plasma phoresis service line. It is uh, directed by one of our transplant nephrologists here. And the reason why this is so interesting is that it is the largest uh, plasma phoresis um, service line in the country. We, uh, we have actually tripled our, uh, our, service, our services because we are not only using it for desensitization or for patients that are rejecting, uh, during COVID, we actually used it as a form of treatment to try to control cytokine uh, storms. So we have learned to use it for specific inflammatory states for our patients, and I, actually that has helped decrease our mortality. So it's very interesting that through our creation of that service line, we've actually been help, able to help all these complex cases that we have. And last but not least was our robotic service line that I, I mentioned that we've already done in, in under a year a year and a half, 200 operations. So it's we're expected to continue to grow exponentially at this point because the across all solid organ transplant service lines, we're, uh, we're finding the greater need. Now, interesting enough, the robotic surgeries are now actually helping patients on the pre-site, patients that are overweight. We are doing bariatric surgeries surgeries to actually help them to get them to transplantation. So it's not only helping on the post side. Uh, to actually take care of patients, but it's also helping on the pre site our patients and giving opportunities where otherwise we would not be helping our, uh, 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 to actually better the care of our patients. Now, I personally believe as medical director here, and so does Dr. Vienna, that quality is of utmost importance. We have created a, almost like our own department within of the MTI called the MTI Transplant Quality Department. And why is this so important? Because without quality, we're not going to achieve what we want to achieve. It's not about the numbers. It's about providing excellence to our patients. So this stems as an initiative, not only here at the MTI, but also at Jackson, which is the hospital where we serve our patients. Um, and as a result of that, the CEO, um, the CEO of Jackson Health System, Ms. Dr. Sambrana, is heading this up. Uh, it does require not only the hospital to be involved and they have their own quality service line, but within MTI, we have assigned a director, uh, uh, Marion O'Rourke, to head this up, which then co uh, collaborates with the quality component at the hospital. So everything is integrated. In fact, we have a transplant quality council that meets uh, on a quarterly basis, and we do report to the hospital the care of our patients. So we actually understand that it's not only what we do outside to take care of our patients, we have to better what goes on within the hospital in order to actually uh, improve our outcomes. So it's a spectacular thing to see. This is not a common occurrence, but it is. Uh, we decided that this was the best way to treat our patients. Uh, the multidisciplinary team involves a uh, tr transplant surgeon, our medical specialist, nurse practitioner. I know in Brazil they do not have nurse practitioners, but actually I've had many discussions uh, about the creation of young doctors as serving as the continuation of care. So though nurse practitioners don't exist uh, in Brazil, there's other entities that could take place to actually shape and be the voice and the, of the continuous care for the patients besides the specialist and the surgeon. We do have obviously nursing care, um, both outpatient and inpatient. As an outpatient, we call them nurse coordinators. I know they, they call them nurse navigators over there in Brazil, but it's very important because they specialize with these patients and they are constantly speaking to them um, in order for us to be able to do the job we need to do. We do involve pharmacists, dietitian, physical therapists, uh, case managers, and more importantly, if the patient's admitted, a, dis a discharge nurse coordinator. So our team is quite big and on a, a daily basis, we do meet across all service lines. 
Uh, what's more interesting is that once a week, we do discuss very complex cases in which the whole MTI is invited to participate via telehealth in order to make decisions on specific complex cases. So that being said, uh, so for hospital beds, we have available uh, about 150 ICU beds. We make about 40 beds and most of the time occupancy is about 80% of the time or even higher. Uh, the hospital has realized that we have to grow to take care of patients both pre and post transplant. So there's a phenomenal inpatient rehab that works with us to make that happen. Uh, pharmacists, just so you get an idea, there's three for kidney, two for liver GI, and two for thoracic, and one for abdominal and thoracic uh, in the ICU as well. Physical therapists, our ratios are usually about one to 50, and they round with us uh, once a day. And in certain places, like in the ICU, they may come twice a day, depending the, the importance of what needs to take place with the patient. Social workers, we share throughout the hospital, and so they're involved with the care. Dietitian, um, six are noted so far, but we are actually growing with the growth of the robotic program with the, uh, 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 forming the robotic bariatric surgery program. Our floor nursing is one to three or max of one to four. ICU nursing is one to two and sometimes with very complex cases like uh, dual organ transplants or, or multivisceral transplants, it may be one to one. And and right now, nurse practitioners, we have the largest in the country, which is about 27. So to date, we, we, we started that program around 2015, and it started with a handful of nurse practitioners. And like I said, we have up to 27. Uh, that involves both inpatient and outpatient coordinator care. So, like I said, in order for us to produce the best quality, we have to have centralization of service lines. Um, we do believe that uh, in each of the specialty, there are certain uh, illnesses, diseases that are contributing to end organ failure. And many times we work with uh, referral um, uh, physicians to establish very specialized care. If you specialize care, then you could optimize care and then get to the patient not only to help them uh, with their medical needs, but to know when to refer the patients. So in kidney, obviously there's diabetes, hypertension, polycystic kidney disease, lupus, and underlying glomerulonephritis, liver failure, we know about acute liver failure, NASH, hepatitis, and alcohol. Intestinal, we have short bowel uh, syndrome, tumors, neuroendocrine tumors in particular, and any patient that might be intestinal rehab. Heart, of course, there's acute and chronic heart failure, congenital heart disease, and ischemic cardiomyopathy, which are the biggest entities that are playing a major role. And in lung, we know there's acute lung failure, pulmonary hypertension, pulmonary fibrosis, interstitial lung disease, and obviously, last but not least, COVID that has afflicted so many patients. But it's interesting to see COVID has affected other organ uh, sets as well. We have had many patients that have required kidney transplants because of the of what has happened with during COVID. We have a very interesting outpatient evaluation of clinical services that obviously involves the physicians, surgeons, nurse practitioners, the nurse navigators that we talked about. We have medical assistant, pharmacists, nutritionists, and social worker. So it's not only in-house, we have a separate entity as an outpatient and it's very important that they work together to evaluate and actually in kidney, and it, it depends in any of the patients that say, for example, with acute heart disease that are, have chronically continued to fail, they actually follow them as an outpatient as well to actually, actually optimize their care, make certain de determinations that they need to go uh, to have an LVAD, have an LVAD as a bridge, or unfortunately, they have to uh, continue to heart transplantation. So the team as a whole is the one that evaluates and makes the decision how to best manage the patients and if we could proceed for transplant or not transplant. We do have a very unique referral desk service line that's centralized and that helps us to actually structure and get the patients in quickly and optimize their care. Um, like I said, in the outpatient referral system, we have all these different entities and then we've centralized the referral desk to capture the patients in a timely manner and get them to clinic immediately. 
there we will make an evaluation to determine a could the patient go for transplantation b does the patient cannot go right now for transplantation but we could optimize them with further uh chronic uh health care or three do we close the case altogether because they will never meet criteria for transplantation i am just going to highlight like for example liver heart bad lung workflow it is a very busy slide but it's just so you get an idea of the entity the complexity of actually following the patients all the different steps that are involved and how many people are involved in taking care of these patients and it, i hate to say kidney goes on even further because the kidneys the patients stay so long on the list that we have to keep regenerating and having them come back to see us to make sure that they're doing well and and acute issues haven't come up so it's very important that we understand the flow because every single team member plays a major role in taking care of our patients. Last but not least is monitoring. If we don't have a way of monitoring, we lose patients. And more importantly, we may not lose the patient, but we're not optimizing them to get the best results. So we have a referral system in place that tracks from the moment the patients come in and where they are in, in the system to continue to see what progression we have in order not only to get them to listing, but more importantly, to get them to transplantation. And then afterwards, how are we going to follow them? We have also the entity of a donor desk, and that's quite unique because not every place has this. We centralized a special place made up of nurses and MAs that actually take the intake of the offers across all service line, and they actually, in a, a very quick manner, get the information to the right doctors so they can make the right decisions, and more, more importantly, get the recipients in, in, the, in the best means possible. The other entity of the donor desk that's actually quite interesting is taking care of the organs so we could actually do well. Prior to us having donor desk, we saw a huge dip of care of our patients, and then once we built this infrastructure, we saw a huge spike of actually organs that we were able to get because we were able to process both the recipient and the offers in, in a timely manner. Again, this is a very complex system of our workflow, but it works for each of the organ sets and each of the organ sets knows who's involved, who they have to contact, when they need to contact. And then from a quality perspective that I quickly highlighted, these are the different branches of what quality does. It creates standardizations. It helps with safety and adverse events. Any patient complaints um, come in in patient satisfaction that we're monitoring. We have management of our data and that it gets presented to the medical directors and the surgical directors on a monthly basis. And they must be presented at our quality uh, at Miami Transplant Institute quality meetings which then on a quarterly basis can be presented be before a transplant quality council. There's constant education and training of new staff that is performed by the quality uh, team. Uh, we make quality assessments. And again, it requires the partnership of not only our staff, but the physicians with the staff to make this successful. And more importantly, to make things transparent. If we do not know what's going on and we do not understand from our uh, who's on our wait list, how to manage the wait list, who gets transplanted, and how to take care of patients afterwards, we will not be successful and we will not, not only be able to grow based on volume, we won't be able to actually take on more complex cases, but more in, uh, importantly, we will not be able to offer the best services for our patients to, ex to get the best outcomes for them. And that being said, that is a quick synopsis uh, within an hour for us to try to understand the importance of an institute, not only within the thoracic world, but actually more importantly, with the whole, all thoracic and abdominal entity. Dr. Gisele Guerra, thank you very much for your presentation, for okay. outstanding for outstanding talk and show in every aspect of uh, MTI. Uh, surely it's raised interest of our listeners. Most of them are young healthcare, healthcare uh, staff, uh, residents, surgeons, uh, young surgeons, and experienced surgeons. 
and uh, I think all of them were delighted to hear from your presentation. Uh, I have a question. Uh, I, uh, I know you take several, uh, a lot of very risk patients, very serious uh, uh, condition from these patients. And what about the difficult treating this patient? Mainly, if I know you get a referral from patient from abroad, how do you follow up these patients when they are uh, from other countries overseas? How do you manage the post? The, the late post-operative of these patients? That's an excellent question. It's really important. So that's why, so first of all, we need to understand um, all the entities of the that patient that's coming. Um, not only from a disease state, how complex their care is going to be, but also from their social support system that they will have. If they don't have the proper social support when they go back home, it's going to be very complicated for us to take care of the patient. The other thing that we try to do is establish a very strong relationship with the referring physician. We need to work as a team. And that goes actually not only for international patients, but patients that live outside of our area and even patients within our area. We cannot take care of so many patients, especially complex patients by ourselves. So uh, when I describe a team, it's not only our team here, but the team Again, outside, the transplant without borders requires the other doctors that they're used to taking care of these patients. So we work together with them very closely. So our monitoring is very important because we have the infrastructure from an IT perspective to keep track of patients, no matter where they're located throughout the world. But the best communication comes from physician to physician. If there is not that close relationship, it's going to be very challenging to take care of these patients. So anytime we have somebody from the outside, we make sure from the beginning to actually uh, have a very strong relationship with those doctors so we could continue to take care of those patients when they go back home. Um, and then obviously we have a very complete, uh, uh, a very complex and complete understanding with the family of why they need to continue to keep my, um, close ties with their their uh, their loved one, but help us to take care of the patients. So it's it's difficult at times, and uh, but it is completely doable as long as there's a lot of transparency and close communication. Dr. Giselle, uh, my congratulations for your excellent job and treating these patients. Muito uh, <laughs> it was our pleasure to have you here. Um, we have no other questions, then I think we can finish your presentation. Thank you very much for staying with us. Uh, now, just a, a few words for our audience. Uh, I'm going to shift from English to Portuguese right now. Uh, pessoal, uh, queria avisar vocês que uh, uh, nós estamos aumentando as inscrições. Uh, foi Nós tivemos mais de 400 ouvintes nessa aula e as inscrições estão abertas até 19, 19 de junho agora. Então, quem quiser participar, é só se inscrever. Tá? Foi uma grande oportunidade de ouvir como funciona o MTI. As próximas aulas, todas segundas, vai ser exatamente como isso é conduzido, o transplante cardíaco. E nós vamos ter a oportunidade também de ver outros aspectos relacionados. Espero que todos participem. Dr. Gisele Guerra, thank you again. Hope to see you next time. Bye bye. Com certeza. De nada. Bye bye. bye. Tchau. Tchau. Somos a Unifesp, Universidade Federal de São Paulo, e temos a missão de defender e expandir a educação pública, gratuita e de qualidade no Brasil. 
Atualmente, a Unifesp possui sete campi. No Campo São Paulo, ficam a Escola Paulista de Medicina e a Escola Paulista de Enfermagem. Na Baixada Santista, estão o Instituto de Saúde e Sociedade e o Instituto do Mar. O Instituto de Ciências Ambientais, Químicas e Farmacêuticas está localizado em Diadema. No Campus Guarulhos, localiza-se a Escola de Filosofia, Letras e Ciências Humanas. Em São José dos Campos, está o Instituto de Ciência e Tecnologia. No Campus Osasco, localiza-se a Escola Paulista de Política, Economia e Negócios. O Instituto das Cidades é o mais novo da Unifesp e está localizado no Campus Zona Leste. A Unifesp é para todos. Universidade pública, gratuita e de qualidade.